an old Calabit love song. <laughs> Thank you. It is an old Calabit love song, and it's sung from the point of view of a young girl called Lipang. And she's sitting outside watching the leaves of the Buakiran tree dry in the sun. And she's calling out to one of her lovers, Agan, to come and lie with her to shield her from the breeze tonight. Kalabit is a language that is listed as endangered, with just 1,200 speakers, and that number is fast declining. But what happens when a language dies? It's as if a whole library is lost. It's not just the words that are no longer spoken or remembered or heard. It is a whole wealth of knowledge, generations and generations of accumulated knowledge that this language holds, and it just fades. It represents the cosmovision of a community, and what do I mean by that? It is the, the reality of a community, the way that they see and experience the world. And don't forget that there are so many realities in this world, not just yours or mine or ours. So that reality, the way that a community sees themselves, is contained and expressed through their language. I am Kalabit, and our library lies mainly in the minds and in the hearts of the elders. It hardly exists in any written form. And when I say elders, I mean my grandmother's generation. I've dedicated my life right now to learning the art forms, learning the songs and the stories and the music of the Kalabit people and the neighboring communities, such as the Kenya and the Penan and the Saban. So why would I, a young urban girl living a very comfortable life in the city, spend hours on a bamboo mat with the elders in the longhouse learning these songs that sound nothing like we have on radio. They don't make any rhythmic sense to me. <laughs> they don't make any sense in terms of melody. Why would I do that? What is the value in it? And if you can just imagine that these songs, the songwriters wrote them, the songwriters that wrote them, they, were, they, they did not come into contact at the time with complicated politics or high-rises or concrete or money. They were the ones that purely coexisted with nature. They were the ones that lived in the primary rainforest in Borneo. The songs that they sing about is about being together by the river with my friends. The dance is inspired by the birds, specifically the hornbill. And the way that our hands move is similar to the way that the leaves fall off the trees. Today, I want to share with you some of the stories that I've had across my journey. This is my great aunt, Tepo Ira and I, in 1994. Tepo Ira is one of the few singers left in the Calabic community. She is the one that taught me that song that I sang for you today. Um, fast forward over 20 years later to 2016, and I was in Barrio at the time. Barrio is one of the Calabic villages, and I was just spending time in one of the coffee shops, and in walks Tepo Ira with her yellow gum boots on and her pink beanie and a basket on her back. And she looks at me and she goes, you, you know I carried you on my back when you were little? I have a photograph of it. And I was like, yeah, 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 that's, that's me. And she looks at me and she goes, come to my house tomorrow, 9 a.m. I teach you how to sing. And I said, okay. So the next day, I went to her house at 9 a.m. And 20 minutes later, she arrived from the farm and she put down her farm produce and she disappeared again for 10 minutes. And then she came in her best dress. She put on her precious beaded belt and her precious beaded headgear and beads around her neck. And she sat on a chair. I sat on the floor. And she said, what song do you want to learn today? I said, I don't know. You called me here today. 
<laughs> so she said, I'll teach you a love song. And she's, she sang for me this song. But you see, our songs, they are oral traditions. They're not written down. And so the process of me learning this song from her is so much more than just, than just learning the melody and learning the words and memorizing those words. It's so much more than that. Inside that song has stories of when she used to sing it as a young girl to the boys of how her mother taught her the stories. In it, there are words that my dad's generation no longer remembers and they sit in the corner, my dad and his cousin, trying to discuss what this word exactly means. It is the whole process of it that is important in oral traditions. But why do I say that these songs are so precious and important? It is because they are being lost. My father's generation do not know these songs. And only a handful of elders, when I say a handful, maybe 10 or maybe less of the whole Calabic community, remember these songs. And why is that? There is a whole lot of reasons, but I want to share with you the two main reasons. The first one is that my father, my father's generation was the first to go to school. And that meant at the age of eight or nine, he used to walk 10 days in the jungle just to arrive at school. So obviously it was boarding school, right? And that meant that he no longer spent time at home with his parents or with his grandparents or with his aunties. And again, the elders at the time put a lot more emphasis on the books that they learn in school because they believed that that was their way out of poverty. And so my father's generation did not learn those songs or the art forms. And another big reason is that when Christianity came into the highlands from the 1940s to the 1970s, the Calabit people embraced Christianity because they believed that it freed them from the burdening practices of headhunting. So they embraced Christianity, and with that, they put aside everything that didn't align with Christianity, and this included the songs and the music, the stories that had elements of animal sacrifice, of lovers, of affairs, of the spirit world, and of creation myths. One story that I want to share with you is that when my female cousins and I were much younger, around the age of 12, we learned um, an old Calabit love song called Ulin. And we were performing this at small functions and at small festivals around Sarawak. And one of the aunties came to us and said, these young girls should not be learning this song. They should not be singing this song, you know? It basically says, if you bring my lover back from the farm safely, I will slaughter a chicken in sacrifice. <laughs> Romantic, right? <laughs> and you know what? We turned to our aunties and said, do you know what we listen to on MTV these days? <laughs> so my journey into kind of learning these old art forms has really not been a straightforward one. Another art form that has struggled comes from the neighboring Kenya community. And it's called the sape. The sape is a traditional lute instrument. And the story goes that the sape came to a man in a dream. This man was a shaman, a traditional healer who could not heal his sick wife. And so a spirit came to him and said, cut down the tree and build this instrument and play for her these tunes and she will get better. And that's what happened. So ever since then, the sape has been used in ritual healing um, ceremonies. But this was again only a practice until the 1940s when the communities in the highlands embraced Christianity. It used to be taboo for women to even touch the sape. But I play the sape, and so do several other girls. And I learned 12 years ago, at the time when myself and seven other female cousins wanted to learn, we approached one of the sape masters, his name is Matthew Ngao. And we said, can we learn the sape? And at the time, 
he was struggling with himself. He was, he was questioning whether or not he should teach these seven girls the sape because it was taboo and what would the community say? And then he just said, you know what? No one in the younger generation is learning. I have to teach them, otherwise it won't be carried on anymore. And so he taught us. And now, today, many people want to learn the sape. Myself, I have students from America, Ireland, Poland, from West Malaysia also. So many people want to learn the sape. This is me and 16 other sape players. We performed together for the first time two weeks ago. And this is a site that you would not have seen eight to 10 years ago. So once at risk of dying, the sape now has a huge uptake. But I need to tell you that the tunes that we play on the sape today are very different from the tunes that were played on the sape only 50 years ago. It's five zero, 50 years ago. The shape of the sape is again very different from the sape that was around 50 years ago. So the sape is an instrument that the community has allowed us to adapt and we continue to adapt it. And so now a lot of people are playing the sape. So I tell you these two stories today just to share with you the themes of cultural transitions. Many researchers and academics who have studied Borneo have said that Borneo has undergone such a rapid change in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. It's undergone a huge rapid change. So how do you think the people there feel like? We first think of deforestation and logging. People are very quick to say that Borneo has changed because of deforestation, and indeed it has. For example, logging has caused a loss of biodiversity. It has changed the landscape completely. It has changed access to wild food for the locals, but it has also created jobs for the local people there, creating a different economy, introducing money to the area. The logging roads also, they mar this, the surface of the earth but they create connectivity. It allows the kids to go to school and to come back every weekend. It allows access to doctors and to towns. The monospecific plantations such as rubber and oil palms that are introduced into the area replace diverse rainforests. So my question as an artist is will our new songs still be inspired by the falling of leaves by the running of the clear water, will we even have any new songs? Today, we no longer practice long ears or tattoos. In my own short lifetime, I have seen so much change from when I was nine years old, there was no electricity in my longhouse, but now we have 24 hour solar powered energy which means that we have freezers. It means that we have television, which gives access to information, but also to pop culture. From cooking everything on the fireplace, now we have gas stoves. And from eating dinner on the floor, we now have tables and chairs. So I glaze over these examples just to demonstrate to you that I, as a young urban, I stand at the crossroad of transition of culture. We will continue to change. We will continue to adapt. We will continue to modernize and to develop as cultures and traditions and communities always do. But what is heritage? In simple terms to me, heritage is the past made present. It's what you choose to be relevant today and it connects us as human beings. I choose to go down this path of saving the old art forms because firstly, there are elders that want to teach it to me. There's a community that already realizes what, it is, what is already lost and what, is what we are currently losing. And there are people all over the world that want to listen. I remind you of the sape, of the old songs, 
that have been ad adapted across the years. And there are things like headhunting, tattooing, long ears that I obviously do not inherit. <laughs> why do we keep some? And then why do we lose some? But then why were they at risk in the first place? What part of you, of your roots, will you guys choose, will you actively choose to make relevant today? In the face of modernization, every day we are changing. We are changing so fast that I think our minds and our souls and our hearts just cannot adapt to it. What are you? And what are we losing? And what is it that we just cannot afford to lose? Thank you.